be a real hazard to other boaters. So got to kind of keep your eye on them. And if you know somebody that is just starting up on those and can, we can get them into a class, if you could send them our way, we would love to work with them just to give them some of the basics so they know um, what at least they should be paying attention to. Voting is fun. All these things we talk about, especially when we're talking about safety, we don't mean to be macabre or negative. It's just a matter of making you aware of some of the things that will help you stay out of trouble uh, and can obviously help you in terms of staying safe out on the water. Uh, you'll notice that uh, I'm wearing my, uh, my life jacket. We recommend that, by the way. That is our credo here is always wear your life jacket when you're on the water. As I think one of my shipmates said earlier, um, if I'm underway, I've got this on. You've got plenty of freedom of motion here. Uh, you can fish. You can do anything you need to do aboard. And if for some reason you end up going in the water, at least you've got your life jacket on so you're not scrambling around looking for it at the last minute. In terms of special gear, there are many different types of life jackets, and I think in the first session, Eric went over a lot of them, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. High impact for water skiing, uh, flexible uh, for paddle sports. Again, that's another jacket that gives you a lot of range of motion. If you've seen them, you've seen them on kayakers and canoeists. Uh, bright colors for hunters, duck hunters. Survival suits for frigid waters, uh, also referred to as Gumby suits in the military. And it's more of a, uh, a dry suit type of a thing for cold water. Helmets for potential contact, this would be people that are, you know, in kayaks in very high current situations where they're uh, traversing uh, all kinds of hazards in the water. That's exactly the piece that I'm talking about for paddling. And wear your life jacket. And I know you don't hardly ever hear that here, so. A um, little quick story. About four years ago, when I had a PWC here and I was out on the bigger water for the first time, we had a relative come up who had never been out on anything other than a small lake. And she, at the time, I think, was probably in her late 60s. So we put her up on what was a three-up uh, personal watercraft at the time, took her out for a ride. And in the course of that, we managed to turn it over because I had never had three people on it up to that point. And we went to one of the local stores to get her a life jacket just like that. When we went in the water, that was the first time I think she was ever in water other than a pool. And it was really a great experience for her because as you know, uh, especially out here in our, situ our, our local waters, uh, water temperature is very, very low here. Even in August, you may have a 70 degree surface temperature, but it doesn't last very long. And at 70 degrees, you can lose your strength very, very quickly. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, a little bit more. But going back to the story, we got into the water and got everybody back up on the boat, and she could not believe how comfortable she was in this life jacket in the water, and the fact that while she was afraid when she went into the water, she got very comfortable. Uh, so it was, uh, it was quite an eye-opening experience for her, and it was kind of a, an interesting thing for my wife and I, too, because we had never turned it over. So all of that stuff you read in the owner's manual about how you get this thing back up once it goes over, it was, it was kind of interesting. Helmets, again, you're probably not going to run into this unless you're in competitive kayaking or that type of thing. But there are all sorts of accessories, as you can imagine, for any kind of a, a water sport you can imagine. One of the important things in our immediate area here is knowing the local water. We'll talk about this in depth as far as charts go. Uh, and also, it's something that uh, you can get information on very quickly uh, through us, uh, through a number of other 
uh, sources in the area because in, in our area there's a lot of what is called shoal water, very, very shallow water, and you need to be paying attention when you're out there because it can come up on you pretty quick. If you've ever been over near Chambers Island, especially towards the south part of Chambers Island and what they call Hanover Shoals, the water comes up really fast. The first time I ever went out there, it did not, the uh, PWC I had did not have a, a depth gauge on it. And we went over and we were probably in about 10 feet of water when we got there. Um, we went on the beach for a while, my wife and I, and then we got back on the boat and started, I thought, well, I'm going to go and just take a look around the island. Well, it turned out that I headed for Hanover Shoals and had not looked at a chart. And in about uh, maybe a quarter of a mile, all of a sudden, fortunately it was a nice calm day, the bottom just came up to say hello really quick. So that can happen to you out here and put you in a really bad situation. So take a look at the area uh, that you're going to be in um, and be aware of what's around. Shallow water. Uh, carry a compass and charts. Uh, it's always a good idea to do that, and probably most of you that are boating have some sort of a depth device on the boat. If you don't, it's a very small investment for a lot of protection so that you know what you're talking about in terms of the depth you're either headed into uh, or if you get off the course or change your plans for the day, you've at least got an idea of what the depth is in the immediate area. GPS is recommended. They're, they're really great, uh, very much like what, you know, pretty much everybody seems to have in their car today, um, even on their phone. So uh, I highly recommend a, a GPS for your boat. And then learn the basics of navigation. As we progress in the course here, you're going to get an opportunity to talk about learning what's on a chart, doing a little bit of plotting on a chart, and just get a general understanding of navigation. Night activity. Uh, everything changes, as I think uh, other people have mentioned, at night. Uh, all of the lighting that's on the shore when you're out on the water has a, has a tendency to obliterate all of your safety lights, uh, the lights for your uh, buoys uh, when you're entering and coming in uh, to either the marina or you're coming into the river if you're out in the immediate area here. Uh, that's an all-around light that that boat has on. And typically that's telling people in the area that that boat is probably anchored. Uh, yes, it is. And navigation lights on um, always when it gets to be dusk, you have a, you actually have a, a mandate to have those on as soon as it, there's a low visibility scenario or you get in close to uh, evening, uh, it's always just good cheap insurance to turn your lights on so other boats can see you. Uh, again, throttle back a little bit. Uh, you don't need to be in a hurry. We talked a little bit about this uh, Securite type of a thing earlier where I don't think it's uncommon. Probably most of us who have been in the water out here have seen the deadhead, the logs that are floating around. They will change your plans. Uh, and if you don't see them, if you're not keeping a good watch and paying attention, uh, that can be very, very dangerous. And listen for other boats. Uh, PWC operations, you shouldn't be operating a PWC after dark because they have no lights on them. They're strictly a daytime type of a vessel. Visibility, lighted buoys, um, so that you're able to recognize what it is. And again, we <coughs> talked about that for a while. We'll get into it again when we get into charts and navigation. Uh, when you're in a smaller boats, specifically kayaks, canoes, uh, if you're paddle boarding, that type of thing. Uh, I would think uh, long and hard unless I had some kind of a good reliable light to be out at night in that. You don't want to be out there by yourself. You want somebody to know that you're out there when you're leaving, when you intend to come back. That's part of what we talked about and we'll get into it here a little bit of float plan. There's a card over there which is very, very good that goes through a, a checklist, one of which is a float plan. And just real quickly, somebody that's going to be ashore, a relative, a friend that knows you're getting underway, where you're headed, 
when you expect to be there and when you expect to be back. Because it's a good idea that, you know, somebody is expecting you to come back and if you're not for some reason, somebody starts looking for you. Um, so be seen if you're out there at night. Uh, have a, an all-around light, even on a, on a kayak like that, so other people can see you. Wear your life jacket. Stay with the boat. Uh, they're talking here about if for some reason you turn the boat over that you're in, um, why would you want to stay with the boat? I don't know if they talked about that before. What's the point of staying with the boat? Easier to find a boat than just a person. Out of That's water. correct. That's exactly right. And as good a swimmer as you may think you are, uh, I promise you on the water things look a lot closer than they really are. And you couple that with very cold water and you have a recipe for a serious problem. So stay with that boat. Uh, use sound and visual distress signals. We talked about that. I think Mac went into that uh, in his presentation. Secure a boat if you're in a current. Uh, going back to what uh, John was talking about earlier, uh, using an anchor. That's where they come in handy. And you know, you can get an anchor obviously for a canoe, a kayak, whatever it is, uh, and that's why you want to have that on your boat as well. You want to have an observer if you're water skiing, um, meaning that somebody is turning around and physically looking at that person that you're towing, whether it's a tube, whether it's a skier. That way, if they do happen to fall, if something comes up, you know, you're watching, somebody's watching for the person that's at the helm. Uh, there are a number of boats, especially the very fancy ski boats that have the big mirrors on them and that kind of thing, but you still need to have an observer because sometimes that doesn't always work that well. Three-seater PWC, uh, that to the best of my knowledge is the most, that, um, the, the most passengers you can carry on a personal watercraft. They're a little bit larger. Uh, they're very comfortable, uh, and again, make sure you've got your uh, appropriate life jacket on when you're on that. And it's got to be impact rated because you hardly ever see anybody going 10, 15 miles an hour on that. They always seem to be wide open throttle. Uh, and if you hit the water, I don't know how many of you have water skied, but uh, if you go down behind the boat uh, in a turn or even somebody that's been cranking it pretty well, when you hit the water, you know you've been somewhere. So that jacket is rated for the type of impact you're going to experience when you hit the water. State requirements vary. Uh, we've got some very good material here both on Michigan and Wisconsin since we straddle both states. So make that, uh, make yourself uh, available to it and, and make sure you've got copies of it. You should have them on your boats. As um, Tim talked earlier, we'd be happy to do a uh, vessel safety check for you. He happens to be holding up a bag now that you get, our little present to you, uh, that gives you all of those things that you need to carry aboard your boat. And it's really great to have those. There's a lot of terrific information in there. Uh, the other thing I would mention in regard to the vessel safety checks is we are just doing this for your safety. We are not a law enforcement agency. We don't have to go and report any issues we find down there and it gives you a leg up to make sure you have the right uh, things as well. So highly recommend that. If there's something wrong with my boat motor, can you guys help fix it? Uh, I can probably recommend a good mechanic for okay. <laughs> uh, These are water skiing hand signals. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because uh, many of them are pretty self-explanatory and uh, there, all of this is in your book and if it's not in your book, I guarantee you there are 10 um, videos on um, YouTube that will show you all about that. Skier after falling, okay to other boats. What, what this is uh, trying to show us here is, again, if you have done any water skiing, you want to make sure you are visible to the other boats that are in the area. Outside of being out on the bay in really big water, you're typically on a small lake somewhere. So the key is that somebody knows that there's a person in the water. Once you get in the water, you're obviously not that visible. So put the ski up. 
take the ski off, put it up, and people can see that a lot better than they can see your head in the water. Responsible tubing. Uh, they're talking typically, I think, about under 80 miles an hour. Avoid sharp turns, be aware of fixed objects. Avoid excessive speed, no jumping of wakes. You hardly ever see anybody jumping wakes out here. They certainly shouldn't be doing it with, a, with any kind of a tube or a skier on. And you should have an observer, as you can see on the uh, PWC here. Uh, she's sitting backwards watching the tube that they've got the kids on. And that's the proper way to do that. Pay attention to what is going on in back of you. Use hand signals to communicate. And obviously always watch the person that you're towing. Fishing and hunting. Who's in uh, You are a boater when you're in a boat out there. If you're hunting ducks or whatever it is you're doing or fishing, uh, you're a boater. You're responsible for being out on the water and responsible for keeping a watch on what's going on around you. Check the weather. And as Jim mentioned earlier, there are a few things that are better than carrying this. Um, this is great, and I have had very good luck with it between here and Egg Harbor, but I would never rely on it because I'm sure like you from time to time you find that you didn't charge it before you left, whatever the situation is, and when you really run into a problem, you want to have a communications device that's going to work. Assign reasons for shooting or casting. Beware of recoil and backswing before you go swimming. <coughs> High fatality rates. Um, I believe the statistic is 85% of people that drown do not have a life jacket on. Now they may have that life jacket in the boat in some cases, that may be in the boat in a nice package that nobody knew about. So the first thing you want to do when you get people aboard your boat, because they're typically not familiar with it, is let them know where that's at. We recommend that you wear the life jackets, especially these smaller jackets. They're not expensive in the scheme of things. And that'll be the difference going back to cold water between you having the ability to get a rescue or losing your mobility in cold water and unfortunately drowning. Um, vessels with low free boards, um, got to be very careful about swamping, about uh, sea conditions. Again, this goes back to checking weather so that when you're out there, you know what to expect. Uh, and with the best of information, it turns around on a dime up here, uh, the weather. You've got a beautiful morning. You're heading over to Door County, wherever you're going, and it's just gorgeous, you know, flat, calm. And then all of a sudden, about uh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, and the sun's been up for a while, now we've got two, three foot waves, and then depending on what the wind is going to do, it can be a very, very different situation headed back, so you need to be prepared for that. Um, accidents in cold weather, we just talked about that a little bit. You want to dress for immersion. Uh, especially on a smaller type of a craft. If you're going to be out there in a kayak, a canoe, uh, paddleboard, you should really be dressed for that uh, because you're very likely going to be in the water. It's not if, it's when, and be dressed for it. Uh, if you're fishing off of the shore, now I notice we just had the ice out here, so the river's open. There's a lot of great fishing going on. I notice people off of Stevenson Island and waders. I don't see one of them with a life jacket. Uh, if those waders fill up, that's a real problem, especially with the current in the river. Um, I don't know if you've ever had waders fill up on you, but it is not fun. And if you're not somebody that, you know, is used to that or has had some training in it, it can very easily mean that that's your last day fishing. Diver's flag. When you see that, uh, you're supposed to stay clear of it. I believe the law in this area here is 100 to 150 feet. Um, double that. You don't want to go near where you see that flag. Somebody um, is down below there. You don't know exactly where they are. And of course, the danger is a propeller strike. So just respect that and stay away from that. 
It's also uh, the uh, code uh, alpha flag. It might be a little bit different. They may show that coming up. If not, I'll make sure you get a copy of that. And as I said, stay clear of the area. And each book has their own regulations. But for the sake of conversation, if you keep 200 feet away from these, you should be perfectly fine. Typically what happens is they will drop an anchor off of, um, off of that flag and then there is a line that attaches to that below the water and they'll go in a circle off of that line. That might be 100 feet from where that line is anchored to the bottom. That's why you need to stay away from because you don't know where those divers are at. Paddle sports. There's a uh, diver in town here. He goes down it's all them lures that are snagged on the bottom. He had a big bag of them the other day. Okay. And uh, he was having trouble getting out of his wetsuit. But he, he looked... But anyway, that's what he was doing. Yeah, he's probably doing real well he said with he's that. He's been doing that for 30 years. And probably doing pretty well yeah. with a bag of them. They get real expensive, as you probably know. Um, follow the rules. We talked about that a little bit on the head of the game here. And please stop me, because I have a tendency to go along a little bit quickly. We're trying to cover a lot of material here tonight. Don't travel alone. Again, it's always better when you have, uh, whether you're diving or water skiing or canoeing or kayaking, it's always better to have a buddy with you so that You've got some help if you need it. At least someone else is around. Beware of uncharted objects, out of sight currents, low head dams, and that type of thing. You obviously want to stay away from any kind of a dam when you're in a small boat like this. You want to dress in really bright colors so that people can see you because you're sitting very low on the water, depending on lighting conditions. Uh, many of us who have been out there know that you get into the sun the wrong way. You can barely see anything uh, in front of you, so uh, be very, very careful and dress properly for that. And stay away from uh, certain things. There's a, there's a lot of good information in your book about kayaking, about paddle sports, which is the probably the number one growing thing on the water these days. So take a look at that. It's very good information. And low profile causes low visibility. River boating considerations. Uh, there's the deadhead we talked about before, a submerged tree. You see that kind of thing, especially in the river, and you'll see it off of the islands. Uh, you want to avoid those areas. Uh, you never know, uh, like the iceberg, uh, you may not even be seeing uh, you know, a third or a, a less of a fraction of what's sticking up out of the water compared to what might be under the water. So get that, as they say, a wide berth. This is called a straining situation where somebody was headed downstream in their kayak and unfortunately met a tree that uh, wants to spend the rest of uh, its life with you. So you've got to be very careful again about knowing where you're at and what's in that particular water. A lot of good uh, information from some of the local companies when it comes to this too. Uh, Wild Rose is one that, uh, excuse me, Wind Rose is one that comes to mind. They do a lot of paddling, kayaking type of sports. They've got a lot of great information about the surrounding waters, and it's a really good source <coughs> of information for you here locally. Roger, I would just recommend, yeah, May is the best month for um, kayaking and rafting the upper Peshtigo River with uh, one of the outfitters up there. Just Right, they've got some great outfitting companies up there. It's a great day. It's yeah. The Grand Canyon, but it's pretty darn nice. Yeah, and they do a lot of uh, whitewater type things with the rafts up there, and uh, it's it's really good. And yeah, Pierce Gorge on the Upper Menominee is a great place. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Whitewater. If trapped in flowing water, keep feet up and pointed downstream. Why would you want to do that? What, what sense does that make? feet pointed downstream. You don't want to go head first downstream and, and smack into something. Put your feet out in front of you. And again, you should have the appropriate life jacket on, which is going to keep you out of trouble. 
protect your pet. 3 points of contact when boarding or moving about. If uh, you've spent any time around kayaks or canoes, uh, the first couple of times that you get in there is a real treat, unless somebody uh, kind of walks you through what you need to do to get in and out. Uh, it's amazing when uh, you get used to that, how much easier it is and how much drier you stay. Canoes account for 75% of paddle sports fatalities. A low head dam. Um, you're talking obviously right where you can, you can barely see that. And this again goes to, and then this is probably what it looks like from the other angle here. This again goes to knowing the water you're going to be in as opposed to just throwing something in the water and taking off. And these are all the different dangerous scenarios that you can get involved in. Circulating, you've seen this at the bottom of dams where you've got that kind of a washing machine churning going on. Uh, stay clear of those structures completely and they can drop several feet. And these are again different ways and they talk about this at length if you find yourself in this situation which hopefully you won't because you will know that's there and you will stay very clear of it. Escape route is near the bottom. Hypothermia. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before, and uh, I don't uh, have to go any further than getting into a cold shower. Uh, you thought the water was warm, and guess what? It wasn't. Your first reflex is what is called a gag reflex when you hit the water, and you're going to hit very cold water here. And depending on the person uh, and the situation, uh, their physical condition, uh, it might not be that big a deal, but you might also swallow enough water to not be able to breathe anymore. So, very, very uh, big deal and something to be concerned with. Again, dress accordingly, dress for immersion. Uh, if you're just going to be out for a day of swimming, typically, you know, not that big a deal. It looks like this is uh, somebody from the local polar club that's going in with the ice hanging behind them. So we've got initial cold shock, which is that gas reflex that you get. And then you get failure typically within, depending on water temperature, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. If you've got a life jacket on, if you had your life jacket on, uh, like a lot of fishermen don't out here, you probably have a much better chance of uh, being rescued. And obviously, when you become immobile, that's what this is for. Long-term long immersion hypothermia is something that needs to be treated medically. If you get somebody that appears to be unresponsive, they've been in cold water, they need medical attention immediately. Um, because that stage four, as you can see, is, is not a good scenario. That's a dry suit that this uh, gentleman has on. And again, depending on what sort of a water sport you're involved in, these are cheap investments versus, you know, not having the right gear. It can really ruin your day when you get soaking wet out in the water and it gets overcast and the wind comes up. Propeller strikes. Um, these are, you know, this kind of a scenario is something that's pretty self-explanatory. If you have somebody that goes in the water, you want to make sure that you shut down that engine when you get close to that person. Um, another thing that we want to talk about when we get to this is all boats over 16 feet have to have what is called a Type 4 throwable. And this is to throw to that person that unfortunately ended up in the water. Uh, even if they have a life jacket on, you might just as well get this out to them. And something interesting about this is when I do that, that's great. They've got, um, obviously, a little bit of additional floating material. But let me show you something that's better. You can order these. They don't cost a lot of money. 
It's actually 50 feet of line. And I can tie this off to a cleat on the side of the boat and throw it out. And guess what? I've got the person that's in the water. They're not just floating around. I can bring them back very, very easily with this. So consider that. In fact, when we do our vessel safety checks, most of the boats that we are checking are over 16 feet. They must have that aboard. It's, it's required. And we ask them to either invest in one of these, which probably under $10, somewhere there, or take some line, 50 feet of floating line that's highly visible, and tie it to that. Director? Yes. I did a boat last summer, a kid that fished the Pepsi River a lot. He had one of those. One day out fishing, he tore it. The next day, he got ordered by the Coast Guard, $280 fine. Oop. There you go. Correct. You want to keep that polypropylene in, inside a bag or something. Right. The sun, the UV from the sun will deteriorate it very rapidly, but if it's inside a bag where the sun doesn't get to it, it'll last quite a while. Yeah, good point. So, again, Propeller strike is pretty obvious. I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time on that. But there is an entire section on there, and we will we can talk about that, uh, about man overboard scenarios and that type of thing, and how you should do that. Uh, something that's very important. One of the other potential dangers of somebody going in the water. And I'll just walk you through it real quick. Usually you're not on the boat by yourself. You want to tell somebody on the boat to don't take their eyes off that person that's in the water. In fact, if you see any of these man overboard drills, there are plenty of very good ones, again, on, on YouTube. Just put in man overboard drill and you'll see two dozen of them. Somebody has to be pointing to that person and not take their eyes off them while the person that's at the helm is making the changes in the course and coming back around for them. So. You can lose track of somebody very quickly in the water, especially in high sea conditions. Very hard to see, even with a life jacket on, once you get away from them, depending on the light conditions, depending more on the sea conditions. You can disappear pretty quickly under a two-foot swell, especially when you're a couple hundred feet away from the boat. So something to think about. And then there is a specific procedure that you would use. Obviously, if the person is close, it's pretty self-explanatory. If the person isn't close, they'll talk about different procedures you can use to go back to that person. But first and foremost, when you get there to perform that retrieval, you want to make sure, obviously, that you shut down the engine. If you've got this hooked up the way it should be, you can pull them back to the boat. If somebody has been in the water a little bit too long, you may need some help with them. But the idea is that's when you've got a judgment call in terms of whether you need assistance or not depending on the situation. Those and that's just coming uh, horse collar shapes and life ring shapes too. Can I, I answer, better. can I answer any questions for anybody? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time tonight. You've got 30 seconds. Thanks, right? Yeah, right.